Hello, welcome to Frank Islam Show. This is Frank Islam. Our guest today is Ambassador Sman Sadiq. He was appointed by President Clinton as the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Fiji. He was also the first Muslim American to be appointed as an ambassador. Ambassador Sadiq was born in Bangladesh. He's a great guy, he's a great friend, and welcome to the show. And it's a wonderful to see you. Thank you, Frank. It's my pleasure also to be here with you again. Again, Mr. Ambassador, you are a constant source of inspiration for all South Asian Americans in this country. Tell us your experience as a U.S. diplomat. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. And uh, Frank, uh, you know, you can serve in any capacity uh, with the U.S. government, and it's an honor. But when you represent the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief of the United States, in his personal capacity, I think it's a great honor. Uh, so the ambassadorial position uh, in, our, in our set of, uh, in, in our constitution, in our set of government is unique. And I, I can tell you this, that uh, my honor uh, in representing my country was just not my individual honor. It was an honor for my community, for my country. Well, and and I, I, I really uh, thought that, uh, uh, that this is a unique opportunity for me to showcase what our country is all about. To show a face, a different, a diverse face of America, which is kinder and gentler. That is true, Frank. This is a new America. Yes. And uh, we, the, 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 the demographic, uh, the cultural aspect is so different than what it was 50 years ago. So you and I represent new America. Thank you very much. Your tenure to Fiji was especially noteworthy. You were in charge of the U.S. mission when a coup took place in that island nation. Those difficult and dark and dreadful days. How was it? This is uh, something that I think back. You know, uh, it happened on May 19th, 2000. And that was my 50th birthday. 50th so birthday. I can never forget that date. And whereas, uh, you know, there was some... Uh, it never slipped from your memory. <laughs> it can't. Uh, and it was interesting because uh, I, uh, I, I was aware that some preparations were being made uh, without my knowledge, quote unquote, at home to celebrate this. And a big party was being organized. In the office they were doing something. But the fireworks that ensued was entirely different. And it changed the whole course of my tenure there. And to be honest with you, uh, Frank, uh, uh, what happened after that date was entirely different, which was I was not even prepared for. The briefing book that uh, I was given by the State Department had, had no such chapters. But I got to tell you this, this was a unique experience. And uh, although I said, uh, let me uh, clarify that it was not good for Fiji, but as, as far as I'm concerned, it gave me a different dimension to the job that I was entrusted to work for. I mean, I saw the collaboration between our security agencies, our intelligence agencies, our civil societies, how we uh, interacted. And you know, it was, it was, it was tough time, uh, but it was uh, something that uh, as, a, as a US ambassador there, I played a leading role. Let me tell you a little history. You know, the reason, and, and, and it's going to be, uh, I'm going to bring it really short. The reason why this coup take, took place was basically because of race line. Okay. Indian Fijians and the ethnic Fijians. Indian Fijians came to Fiji 120 years ago as indentured laborers working in the sugarcane fields. And all, uh, but they're smart. And what's their population, so the Indian uh, in that part of the nation? Well, about uh, half? Uh, about 40 percent now, 40, 42 percent. It was half, but there's been a lot of emigration, sure, et cetera, sure. et cetera. You know, they came as indentured laborers, but they're hardworking, they're smart. Gradually, they started taking over commerce. They start, and, but when they took over government, the, the Fijian tribal chiefs got very unnerved. And that was the genesis of the coup. I understood. But Frank, listen, here I am, a, a U.S. ambassador. A South Asian. So, so you, could, you could see the sensitivity, yeah. uh, the, the, the delicate line that I had to walk. But uh, the day I enter, came to Fiji, uh, carrying the American flag, I made it amply clear to all parties concerned in the country that my mission was that of America. Sure. I represent the United States of America. My, the color of my passport is blue. And so there was no debate or discussion as to which side I am. So when the coup took place, you know, this is the province, this is an area where the Aussies and the Cubans have a lot of influence. But the military, the uh, civil society 
the tribal group, they all said that, look, we want the U.S. ambassador to mediate and to be uh, involved so in the resolution. The man, you're the man who united them. I thank you for your leadership and thank you for serving our country. Uh, I want to shift just care a little bit and talk about the Council of American Ambassador where you're involved. Tell me a little bit about what's, all, what's this all about, what their missions, what their goals, what objectives are. I know you were active there. I, 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 I saw your column and you sent me a copy of that, so I appreciate what you did. Thank Tell you. me a little bit Thank about you. this thing. The Council uh, uh, of American Ambassadors is a, is a 501c. It was started in 1983 by a group of former U.S. ambassadors who are not Korean, they're political uh, ambassadors. And the, the reason uh, why this was established was, you know, the career people had the Foreign Service Association. Sure. And so we need, uh, this platform was created uh, to propagate uh, the issues, current issues, contemporary issues, to liaison with the State Department uh, to, uh, and to, with other countries. We hold uh, different uh, roundtables with different governmental heads with ambassadors here. We carry out uh, fact-finding missions. We, we had a group going to Cuba. We are thinking of going to North Korea uh, and even Iran. You know, one of our, one of our members, who, who we call our honorary patron, is uh, President George H.W. Bush, because he was ambassador to China and the United Nations. Correct. So uh, it's, it's, it's a good organization that, is, that, is, that, that debates issues, current issues, and we are, we are asked uh, by the State Department or the White House to give our opinion on many, many issues, and which we gladly do uh, when a, a, career, a non career uh, ambassador is nominated by the president. Uh, sometimes the, war, or the, the White House will ask the CEF their opinion. We also uh, are involved in the orientation process. Well, that's nice. That's the, that's the first step towards being ambassador. So when you get a, when someone gets uh, nominated by the president to be the ambassador, uh, the CAA will sit with that person and give them uh, a briefing and some orientation. I'd like to talk a little bit about you know South Asian American, which includes the Indians and the Bangladeshis and Pakistani. They all share a common history, common heritage, and that has been there for thousands of years. Yet they cannot set aside their differences to work for shared goals because they share a common fear. Tell me a little bit why this was divided. This is unfortunate, Frank, as you know, because we have a common history, a common heritage. Despite the fact we see that, uh, that there are some uh, uh, lines that are drawn between the, three, uh, gr between the groups there. Uh, imagine if there was no such lines. If you are a Hispanic in this country, you are, it doesn't matter whether you're from Venezuela or Bolivia or Colombia. You're Hispanic. Yeah, and absolutely. look at the clout you have. Exactly. And look how well they are doing in this, world, in this country. Whereas uh, you are, we are represented here not as one common diaspora, but you are Indian American or Pakistan American or Bangladesh American. And, and frankly speaking, sometimes they work against each other. It's unfortunate. This, this, this so vital uh, population base in this country, which is highly educated, they have a very, they're the, one of the highest per capita income. If they get united, I, I think they will it, have a strength. They will have strength, and they can do a lot of good things for this country. This and is our country. We need them. We need them. We need them very we much. We need the unity. So we need the unity, and it'll be good for everybody, for the country, for the for the diaspora. As a matter of fact, the, as you probably know, this uh, Obama administration has appointed. Uh, uh, many, many South Asian in the sub-cabinet job, but also uh, in, the, in, the higher, in the higher echelon of the administration. So what have they changed in the past decade? Well, I think uh, I, I must congratulate the Obama administration for the outreach they have done uh, to the South Asian community. I mean, as you, as you just said, Frank, that there have been sub-cabinet appointments. Uh, I think uh, of all this group, the Indian Americans have, uh, have come out they have a good playbook, they're well educated, they're well trained, and I congratulate them. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the Pakistani Americans, the Bangladeshi Americans have not stepped up. Have not done as well as the Indian Americans And have they done. should. They uh, have the capability. Right. Yes. They have the content you're right. uh, to, to serve uh, uh, this administration and future administrations. And I hope things will change. Uh, we, ha we have a lot to learn. Yes. And, uh, you know, we have seen 
uh, previous immigrant stories, whether you're Italian American or Jewish American or uh, Polish American, and see how they have progressed. And there is uh, there is a lot to learn, and uh, I hope uh, we need to learn and listen from each other. Absolutely. We'll be right back. We'll take a break. Welcome back to the show. We have been talking to the Ambassador Sadiq, who is the Ambassador of the United States to the Republic of Fiji. Ambassador Sadiq, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, we talked a little bit about the fact that they, there are a lot of the South Asian American that are, they are very much engaged, and they're also part of the Obama administrations. But when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, they're not that much engaged. Tell us uh, what they need to do to get engaged. They do have a capacity as well as capability to be engaged in it and make a difference. Uh, it's a very good question. You know, engagement just cannot start from the top. Engagement has to be from the bottom. I, I, I would say that uh, this community has a lot of potential to engage themselves from grassroots level, whether you're in the school council or state legislature or county uh, delegation, whatever it is, you have to start from there and build your capacity. It's a question of capacity building. And uh, we have the potential to do that. I see a lot of hope for the simple reason that you know there are some uh, uh, people from the Indian subcontinent who are now serving in, in the state level. And I understand that there will be a uh, there will be a lieutenant governor from the Indian community who, for, for uh, you know, contesting the Virginia election. Correct. But, but your question is that why are we not in policy making? If the, if I'm correct, is that what yes, I meant? Yes, uh, especially in foreign policy. And, and and especially when it relates to South uh, to South South Asia. Exactly. I think uh, uh, in due course uh, we will uh, we will see something. We have a USAID director, so obviously uh, who's Indian uh, American. Obviously, policies are made at that level, which is a very high level. We'd like to see that uh, when, when, when there are issues relating to South Asian problems, that the policymakers seek out people of our background. Because you know what? We can not only give them content, but we can also give them a viewpoint which might be missing within that particular uh, debate. Because, because your experience is grounded in the fact that you came from that part of the continent. Yes. We relate to both parts. Exactly. And, very well said. And this is very unique. I wanted to ask you questions and share with, uh, with our audience your thoughts um, because the fact that a lot of people get a lot of uh, emails and letters from the political candidates and saying, please contribute. So the question for you is, uh, Mr. Ambassador, why people should be politically engaged and why should they make any contribution to any of the political candidate? Uh, what is in for them? You know, uh, it's, it's again a very important question because in order to make yourself heard and known here, you got to get into the arena. And you can do it by contributing your time or contributing your resources. It's very easy to criticize issues sitting outside. But I would love to see our, our community get involved in the process and get in the arena, get involved in the political process, and then find out where it needs to be fixed or tweaked. You know, criticism from outside is passe. You know, you are not going to achieve anything. You know, you got to get, you have to have some skin in the game. And the only way you can do it is practical involvement oh. and on di different issues. Uh, you know, the parties define the landscape of America. And if we are engaged and involved uh, politically, that allows us to build America for all Americans, just not just not for the few. So you said very well, it allows you to give a seat on the table to make sure your voices are heard. Absolutely. Very well said, and thank I, you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I appreciate it very much, and I think uh, that we all, we all should uh, take a step back and say, hey, look, what can we do to make this country better? Absolutely right. This audience will be delighted to hear about your background, and you were born in Bangladesh. And you also belong to a very prominent family. You still cherish, nourish, and nurture your family's finest tradition that is sharing, loving, caring, and giving. Tell us about your background. Tell us why you are so much, uh, your, your 
engagement in the political parties in Bangladesh and now here in this country as well? Well, first of all, you know, this is a great country for, for anyone from any part of the world. All of us to, share a common, to, to, ground, common faith in this thing, that so is that we, we love this country. Well, I came uh, from a family of educationists uh, and uh, I was born in Dhaka, Bangladesh. But I left the country during the civil war that uh, ensued between East and West Pakistan. And you I came was, as a student? I came country? as a student. I was fortunate uh, to be able to come here as a student because uh, uh, I was accepted under some very extreme circumstances. And, uh, and this shows uh, the, the, the warmth and the generosity of, our, of this society in this, this country. The, and openness and inclusiveness that we yeah. can all proudly and truly embrace of America. That is correct. And, and, and you know, in, a, in a span of almost 40 years, I, 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 I got a great education here. I had a great run uh, in business. And I found the love of my life here. So, uh, so you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, you a fairy tale. You made an America. I have married just like here. I did. I, I, we married here. I have four children who are doing very well. And you know, I, I, I thank the good Lord for His blessings. But I also thank the, the, this country, which has enabled me to prosper and proliferate in any in all these areas. So it, this this country remains a shining city upon a hill, as John Winthrop said in the year 1632 when he saw the city of Massachusetts. Well, that is absolutely true. And you know, sometimes it's very fashionable these days to kick this country around. But I tell you, this is the last frontier. If you cannot make it here, you cannot make it anywhere. Very well said, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, your background. We talked about some of the issues that this country faces and, and, and the challenges that South Asian American faces. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your readers, your private uh, sectors that you have been involved since you left the uh, public sector as an ambassador, what you have been doing. I know you had a travel agency, which you sold it, made a little bit of cash that allowed you to prosper and live nicely. So tell a little bit about what you've been doing since then. Well, uh, I was in the private sector before joining the government, and I was in the transportation travel business. I was in real estate and other areas, and I don't miss it at all. I have a philosophy that uh, you know you never look back, you look forward. So since uh, coming out of public service, uh, I have been very actively engaged in several important boards. Uh, I, am, uh, I am in an advisory capacity with some multinational organizations which wants to make a breakthrough in different parts of the world. My network, my connectivity uh, has come to, uh, come to use uh, for these kind of groups. And I have, I'm very happy to say that I've been also been able to uh, engage myself in policy debates with different uh, quasi and, uh, and governmental organization in this country, uh, both uh, uh, in areas of foreign policy, commercial uh, issues, and also in the areas of intelligence. Wow, intelligence as well? That is correct. Wow, so you have been very much engaged and involved and well-informed, not necessarily the public sector, but the private sector as well. That is correct, that is correct. That has you, that kept you busy? It keeps me very busy, and for the first time in my life, I think I can control my schedule a little bit. It doesn't happen all the time because my travel is quite extensive, both domestically and internationally. But the most important thing is that you know I find a fulfillment that you know here I am, uh, an immigrant who did well in the private sector, who was uh, fortunate and honored to carry the American flag, and I'm back now being a productive member of the society. Tell, tell this audience that, uh, and a lot of uh, young generations and the people looking, uh, hearing you, your story, a wonderful story from humble background and a journey to America. You aimed high, you work hard, you were able to pursue the American dream. What advice do you have for them? Uh, these people are young, they, only, they, want, they have a lot to offer to this country. What advice do you have for them? Well, uh, what I can say very clearly is Never give up on America. Never give up. As never give Mr. Up Churchill America. said many times. Never give up America. This is the country that you can aim high, shoot for the stars. And then you know what? You, if you work hard, if you play by the rules, you will make it in this country. And in, uh, uh, at the expense of sounding a little bit corny, let me tell you this. It can happen only in America. So your story can only happen in America. It reaffirms the notion that America is a great country. Absolutely. And anything can happen in America. That is true. Where impossible can be made possible 
unacceptable can be made acceptable. That is absolutely well, true. thank you very much for coming to our show, Ambassador Dake. It was wonderful to see you, and you will continue your journey so the people in the audience could be inspired by your story. And thank you. Thank you, Frank. It's a pleasure to be here, and I will uh, always cherish our relationship. Thank you very much. This is Frank Islam wishing you a great week. Mm -hmm.